Hello and good afternoon or good evening. Maybe for some of you it's good morning too. I'm David Metcalf and I'm at the University of Central Florida's Institute for Simulation and Training. Inga asked me if I would uh, talk a little bit about some of our connections with M-Learning and M-Health during this week of the Moby MOOC where we talk about uh, some of those cross-sections of those topics. So I do have a uh, presentation that I plan. We may wait a couple more minutes to see if a few more people join. But I did want to give you that quick overview. I have uh, two presentations uh, that uh, I thought I might draw from with uh, some unique sets of examples. And I thought I might go through one that kind of links mobile learning and in health together. So uh, making mobile work is the title of this one. And I thought it might be good to uh, just go through some of the uh, different uh, components of this. and. Uh, look at some of the different uh, features and interconnects between the discipline of mobile learning and the disciplines of mHealth. So just to give you context, I'm at the University of Central Florida. And inside of the University of Central Florida, we have an institute for simulation and training. So a lot of the work that we do is actually in the area of simulation. And we've started to add mobile as a key component of the ways that we enable human performance using a variety of techniques. So you can also see that we're uh, the second largest university in the US and have a lot of computer science students and a lot of game design students. So that gives us a good base to draw from to uh, build out some of these capabilities. My laboratory specifically is called the Mixed Emerging Technology Integration Laboratory. And we've worked on things in the commercial, government, academic and nonprofit sector for a number of years. You see a few examples there. All of our work focuses on learning, performance, and well-being. And that's maybe the connection to health and healthcare when we start looking at how mobile devices have changed that. While we do a lot of work in mobile, you'll also see in our tag cloud in the center that we also do a good bit of work in games and simulations, virtual worlds, other collaborative technologies, and sort of the web 2.0 and beyond. So hopefully you've uh, seen that before and uh, start to see those different components coming together in new and unique ways. And that's what we have uh, a few examples to share with you. I know these are really small on your screen, so I'm going to give you some bigger pictures of some of these projects, especially the ones that are related to healthcare, in, uh, to give a little more detail. I think I mentioned last year's Moby MOOC that one of the things that I've been kind of fascinated by is where is value actually being created? in essential services like healthcare, education, uh, helping build commerce or businesses, and entrepreneurship across the globe. And we're finding that the more we look at the societal trends, not just the technologies around mobile, social, and real time, that that's where at least some of the venture capital community thinks that value creation is, is starting to happen in our society, even in the midst of some of the economic downturns that we're seeing across the nation. So what are some of the key five trends or ideas in M-Learning and M-Health that uh, are starting to take hold? And how are they starting to interact and interrelate? One that I've been talking about for years and years is really developing once and delivering in many different formats. And you can see that uh, here. This could be anything from developing once for mobile devices and also for desktop devices using HTML5 or 10CAN as the new emerging standard for SCORM to uh, other examples where we have cards, mobile, virtual worlds, and games kind of coming together in new and unique ways. One example of this was for Johnson & Johnson. They had built a 3D virtual uh, university and uh, for pharmaceutical research and development. And one of the things that uh, they uh, had found was that all the information was then locked up inside of the 3D world. They wanted to be able to also have access to it on their 2D knowledge bases like SharePoint and on their mobile devices. Another example from our US military is some work that we've done to help with humanitarian assistance and disaster relief efforts where you're trying to provide care for people like in Haiti when the uh, earthquake first happened a couple years ago. Being able to send a physical deck of cards with our um, soldiers who are also medics, combat medics, to be able to know the life-saving procedures and have reinforcement and refreshment uh, of those concepts in a physical deck of cards. 
it's a mobile device in essence, <laughs> a deck of playing cards, but it has all those different treatment procedures on them. And then you also, once they found out that they had network and power, uh, they were able to take over the electronic version on the iPhone. And they were also able to practice back in what they called the schoolhouse or the classroom with these online uh, editions of the card games that were a lot that they could play with uh, these cards. So multiple modalities. In our own College of Medicine, which we helped launch a couple of years ago uh, at University of Central Florida, we found a need to start to integrate simulation, IT enterprise systems, mobile, um, together to solve the medical education needs that they had. Things like building out virtual patients, like the ones you see in the row at the bottom of the screen, to helping design a master schedule that could be delivered over all the iPads and iOS devices and other mobile devices from Blackboard to laboratory manuals that were online to complex animations and visualizations and also having the access to uh, things like our virtual family. So those are all things that you, uh, that you see on the screen here too that are all part of an integrated curriculum. The other thing that I've been uh, promoting is looking at not just um, not just apps or web, but also messaging. So I guess the question is, is it messaging versus apps versus web? Or is it a little bit more of an integrated approach where you actually have messaging and apps and web? A lot of the eLearning Guild research from a few years ago were actually done for um, a thousand companies and pr took their information. And we found that email and text messages were the most popular in learning delivery methods. But they were also used in conjunction with podcasts, apps, mobile, web, etc. And uh, by the way, Elizabeth, we will make this available as well to you um, and to others too. Um, both as the slides and also this is being recorded too. So be happy to do that and also share some of the samples. We also have done a project for virtual patients too with four, 20 years of medical history for a virtual family compressed into four years of medical education and then having the um, ability to have a very realistic scenario where your mobile device is with you as a doctor all the time, a good bit of the time in the practice of medicine and you also have things like patient interviews, electronic health records, and access to those electronic health records over your mobile device. We've tried to design very realistic scenarios, sort of like mysteries of the ER, where the data unfolds. You might get a fictitious voicemail from this uh, young girl's mother saying, um, Sarah's got a cough. I wonder if I could bring her in to check her. So she has a cough. We know that now. That's sort of the first data point. We might also then... Uh, ask Sarah some questions of her virtual, um, as a virtual patient, and then follow it up with some tests, like the ability to do an x-ray. And the x-ray results would uh, then be displayed either on your mobile device, or you can go and look at it on screen. There's a game engine that's keeping track of all of these things ongoing. Another project that we did that leverages this cross-platform uh, connection, and this was a global project, um, even had people in Australia going through this as well too, Elizabeth, um, was for a mobile and cloud-based learning program at Google. They wanted to have interactive education that they called G-Learning, um, using our moving knowledge engine for leadership, new product launch, presentation, and it used text message, um, email primarily, and it could also use voicemail and web. But we had about a thousand participants and they were able to get their access to training just in their inbox, the same way they get their other tasking. And it might be a launch of a video of Sergey Brim talking about the importance of leadership. And then it might also have a connection to a discussion board right after that that's launched by a keyword. So you progress through the whole curriculum, through your inbox, through text messaging, and it launches the other media and content that's more robust securely inside the cloud. When, before we started this, they had a 30% start rate and a completion rate they won't talk about. After this, with the gamification elements that you had in here, with the elements of uh, interaction and the motivation because of a leaderboard 
that uh, showed where everybody else was across the globe in terms of completing the leadership course. They went to 94% completion and had a 4.5 out of 5 uh, reaction level, uh, Kirkpatrick level 1 data set. And uh, it was very time and cost efficient to put this together. So these are some things that we're seeing that people might have forgotten about the power of messaging. But yet the power of messaging across the globe is significant. So in learning is really bigger than just us as an in learning segment or industry. It goes into other areas of health campaigns, IT, marketing departments that all have a need for learning and human performance. And we're starting to see that this is even uh, outgrowing into health and well-being and saving lives. Much bigger than just thinking about us as learning professionals. We're seeing these groups that are doing this type of work um, really across the globe for anything from a major health campaign with a billion messages to marketing departments that want to um, give information out to people and communication departments that want to give out information out to people, um, say on health campaigns. Um, and really, it doesn't matter whether someone sits inside of a sales organization, inside of a nonprofit, inside of a training organization like many of us do. Um, it's a matter of how we start to think bigger than just us, but also for uh, US compatriots, I put two dots in there, bigger than the US. We might think because uh, the Android operating system and iOS operating system are uh, built here and that we have some very sophisticated smartphones that uh, we become kind of uh, the, the center ring in this. But uh, what I found in my uh, works with Linnaeus University, with uh, my colleagues in, uh, in throughout Europe and the UK and into Africa is that there is a lot of contribution that is happening outside of the US that we really need to pay attention to. And I know that this is a global and distributed audience, so I might be preaching to the choir, but I think as a US person, it's important for me to, uh, to kind of say this to my fellow compatriots and uh, let them know what I'm thinking. So I usually ask the question, anybody know what the largest in-learning initiative um, is? I think it's the largest in the world, but it's the largest that I've seen. And Elizabeth, if you have a guess, you, you, you may have a, a thought there. I'll go ahead and just kind of spill it, but uh, there's a company out of New York uh, called Frog Design that was working on Project M in South Africa to change the hearts and minds of people and their behaviors around HIV and AIDS. And they had a billion message campaign that actually had outcomes of getting 15 million people to take positive actions of calling a help support line, seeking out new information, and in general changing attitudes about HIV. One of the hardest things to do. It's easier to educate skills or facts or procedures. It's much harder to change behaviors and to change attitudes. And this campaign has some early evidence of having done that. And for a billion people. So significant, significant out, uh, uh, outcomes that they've achieved. We've also been trying to take our own little small steps in uh, Haiti using some of those same thought processes and uh, using some techniques of providing microfinancing for teachers and clinicians to be able to get things like an Android device and a basic uh, Pico projector, a little handheld uh, projector about the size of a smartphone that you can actually uh, go and project onto a wall. and. Uh, in a, any wall, anywhere, and be able to have kind of a classroom in a box or a kit. And uh, in some ways, this technology is actually allowing people who don't even have walls around their classroom anymore to leapfrog some of the work that we've been uh, seeing in other parts of the globe and even in the U.S. So we're hoping this starts to spread in rural communities and other areas. And I think this is a significant way of merging in learning, in health, public health campaigns across the globe. So I'm pretty excited about some of those trends, uh, as you can probably tell, too, because I think it has real global impact. The other thing that we've been looking at with uh, in-learning is uh, how it's become more integrated. We've been able to do things with peripherals, like a blood glucose uh, meter that has a Bluetooth connection that automatically populates um, a record on your mobile device and then sends it up to your electronic health record automatically. Uh, digital pens that uh, can go and record um, everything that you would uh, say in a conversation and uh, make that part of a medical record and transcribe it, like this pen right here, too. So I'll leave that for a second, a little visual aid. <laughs> Hopefully you can see that. 
So it captures uh, the audio as well as the written notes and can convert that to text automatically. These are things that are changing the speed and efficiency with which doctors can work, for instance, or other people in other uh, fields. We even have things like 3D scanners. I'm not sure if you can see what I'm clicking on here, but I'm actually pointing to the last thing in the row of objects, a 3D scanner out of Germany that allows you to go and in just a few minutes scan a whole person's face or parts of their body to especially ones that might have a medical condition and have a 3D model of that. And I'm looking at your note here too about the challenges in uh, Torres Straits too, so with indigenous communities. And that's exactly where we want to uh, help too. And uh, chronic diseases like diabetes and other things like that, we're starting to find that this mobile ecosystem of these blood glucose meters that you can have or being able to have the blood pulse oximeter so that you can keep on someone on a round-the-clock basis, you have a full data stream in near real time that's accessible to you. You can also have social and peer-based networks that come together too. So you have kind of a socio-constructivist peer group that's going to help you manage your disease state and conditions. These are the things we're starting to see. One of the things that really blew me away too that I have down at the bottom of the screen here is um, what happens when the knowledge bases that you have across the globe become part of that community. By that I mean what happens when you can have um, all 200 million pages of curriculum and Journal of American uh, uh, Medicine available to you through something almost like your Siri interface. interface. But for those of you that have seen it, IBM Watson, which uh, won one of the chess championships, um, at the m most recent HIMSS conference, which is the largest uh, healthcare IT conference in the world, they actually showed this Watson engine from IBM doing differential diagnosis, meaning making expert decisions on healthcare alongside a doctor and being right much more often than initial diagnosis of something as complex as cancer um, from the data that's available. Uh, much faster than a human doctor, and in many cases with just as good or greater accuracy. So that's going to change fundamentally the way that healthcare is done and the way that computers are used in that too, when there's more information than any one doctor can know at this point. The only way to do it is by collaboration with doctors, where they're consulting with each other through telemedicine, using some of the cameras we have on our phones, and being able to consult with people around the globe and also adding in this computer capability that we have too with uh, big systems like Watson or even the day-to-day -day Siri or Dragon systems. There's a whole bunch of things going on in health today. This is a, a partial list from some of the things that we saw in our book uh, called In Health that Rick Crone and I wrote for HIMSS uh, recently. Um, and you know, in health at its core is the delivery of healthcare services via mobile communication devices. And that could be for doctors, it could be for allied health workers, nurses. It could also be for um, those uh, uh, patient, you know, patients that are suffering from a disease state. Um, those are all things that could, uh, that could be part of this. What might be interesting to you is the middle stats that you may not have seen from places like Jackson and Coker talking about 80% of doctors have a smartphone. Hims also announced that 100% of doctors reported in a survey they did reported using smart using phones, cell phones of some sort, in their practice of medicine on a daily basis. So even if they don't have a smartphone in the U.S., they may be using a traditional phone to get text messages or to send messages or to call in orders to pharmacies. Those are all things that be legitimate purposes and reasons to use a cell phone or to get uh, critical information about a patient. 70% of doctors plan to use an iPad. Um, within the year and the end of this year. And another set of stats around games and mobile that might be of interest is that uh, 2.5 billion of the 10 billion to 12 billion dollar uh, game market is mobile and casual games. And mobile is six, has been growing at a 16.6 percent rate. So people think, oh, mobile phones are too small to do anything. Well, people are playing games on them and they're using those little small bits of time. So um, many people have had a problem with the term gamification. Because there's good gamification and there's really bad gamification too where you just use it to manipulate people or you just use it to try and make something that is ultimately boring a little bit fun. But what we've been finding is we've been using gamification techniques for years. Things like adding a leaderboard or using real world simulations and real world environments to, uh, within simulations and game mechanics in a non-game setting. Things that are very serious, we still use some of these techniques like the virtual family that you saw a few minutes ago too. 
and we're, we're replacing some of the traditional courses with some of these learning games. Um, when we work in the healthcare space, we seldom call them games, but we're using these techniques. We're using things that have been proven to work within uh, uh, game play, game mechanics, and uh, putting those into practice. And we're not the only ones. Uh, as you can see, a big part of what's uh, helped the U.S. economy along is this Facebook app economy. Worldwide, it's uh, created 200,000 new jobs and uh, 12 billion in wages just in 2011. We don't have the 2012 numbers yet, but I'm sure they'll be big too. And many analysts are saying that, uh, that this gamification trend is going to hit a good number of the largest companies in the world, the global 2000, over the next uh, year and a half. So it's a trend worth paying attention to, even if you don't necessarily agree with everything that's being done, um, still something to take a look at. We've been using this to help, uh, something we launched in 2007, help kids learn about math and science, using sports as a theme. And uh, the MySportsPulse.com uh, website and program are still up. We've had famous athletes from across the globe, um, including some of our professional uh, American football athletes, as well as um, baseball players and uh, uh, football players, soccer players uh, from across the globe, talk about the importance of math and science in their sport. And things like the arc of an angle of a ball are being measured by kids, and they uh, grow their avatar. And the, uh, over on the right-hand side, you see some of their points in, in topic areas, which are a little too small for you to see there, too, but hopefully you'll be able to zoom in on them. It says science of sport, the uh, engineering of equipment, fitness, nutrition, and will to succeed. And uh, those are some of the different topic areas. But we gave them a choice of text message, interactive voice response, email, and web browsing. And uh, it was uh, something that uh, was time-spaced over um, a few weeks. And we actually saw a significant increase, 10% to 16% uh, increased interest in math and science careers, as well as some uptick in their actual performance on those topic areas in an international baccalaureate curriculum at the seventh grade level. And um, even also saw some improvements in their fitness. And uh, because of the sports theme, they actually uh, went, moved up uh, about 10 or 11% increase in uh, those that were doing one to five hours of uh, physical activity per week, up to six to 10 hours per week. So we actually had some uh, uh, experimental outcomes that were kind of interesting in the, as we did this in uh, the US, in Sweden, Uganda, a few other places across the globe that we tested it in too. We also saw a need to do the same thing for the uh, re uh, fairly recent Michelle Obama apps for health book style games, sort of like Farm Bill or Mafia Wars, that teaches kids about eating the right foods and simulating eating those foods that allow you to have enough energy to complete little local neighborhood missions, like rescuing a cat from a tree. And if you do that, you get enough money to uh, get into superhero school and buy your costume. And uh, that's the goal of the game for them, too. It's, again, for 9 to 12-year-olds. But if you think about what we're doing is applying anything that has a role with levels and knowledge, skills, and abilities. And we've been able to build out a game framework that works just as well on your desktop as on any mobile device all the way down to a BlackBerry using HTML5 and some other techniques that uh, have allowed us to, to kind of get a little head on this uh, curve of uh, um, games and innovation. We've also used our moving knowledge engine to do things like Twitter challenge at conferences and um, be able to um, not only use this for kind of interactive, uh, real-time education, but also to be able to use this for interaction, even with people like um, uh, medical recruitment in the Navy, um, that you'd want to give people an understanding of what their career path is and how some of that might work in a game setting. If you look at this middle section where it says healthcare, what does that look like to those of us who are instructional designers? It looks like a skill tree for a job task analysis. And as you go up in that skill tree, you can actually see what your path is in the US military if you are going to be a medic going up in progression to being an EMT, to being a corpsman nurse, or other uh, roles like that, up to physician or other, other roles. And you can see that uh, kind of visually. And as you complete missions, you go up further and step in a simulation of that. So you've got a mobile component, a simulation component, kind of working in conjunction for some of the stuff with our uh, uh, Navy uh, activities. Another example of this is uh, a game that uh, was produced for BMW's uh, Mini Cooper division. 
it's an iPad game. If you think about the launch of a new car, you have to train all of the uh, salespeople in the various dealerships across the globe how to how to sell those features or understand those features well enough to use them. In this case, um, you have a location-based map, and four people get in a car, three of them looking at the iPad, one of them driving, and uh, you go through a city street set of maps, and as you get to these little pins on the map, it actually launches a video of some feature of the car. So you've got contextual learning that's happening. And they can cooperate within the car and within the dealership, but they can also compete against other dealerships across the globe to see who knows the most about the car. And this is a spin-off called Ology Interactive that's done this. Another thing that I'm excited about is uh, kind of location-based services. We, uh, I live uh, right by Cape Canaveral, and uh, a couple years ago I got to see the launch of a new uh, fleet of satellites for GPS. They can actually do GPS through the walls, and many types of walls. It doesn't go through all metal walls, but uh, uh, we'll go through many types of walls. So you can have indoor GPS, and you're starting to see Google and others take advantage of this. This is going to un unleash a whole new capability of contextually aware learning. You walk up to the room that you're going to be in for... Um, surgical training and it gives you the notes as you walk into the room and uh, you might have a directory of a building and know exactly who is where in that building on your handheld mobile device too all from this new GPS capability. I alluded to this earlier but one of the things I'm most excited about in M health and in learning is the um, ability to take these other peripherals like the smart pen or the blood glucose meter or even the ability to have your EKG and EEG data sent to you automatically um, in real time over technologies like Airstrip, or to have more physical security with a uh, ID badge that is uh, conforming to whatever security standards you have, like HIPAA or, or other medical security uh, regulations. And um, all of these things working together, rather than just the mobile device by itself, is going to unlock even more capability than we're already seeing. And that's pretty exciting to me when I start to think about how these peripherals are going to be used in conjunction with the mobile device and others. Some of the work we've been doing recently is uh, actually 3D uh, work, too. We have a couple of phones that actually have 3D uh, screens that don't require glasses. And there's been some good clinical evidence of improvements in medical outcomes when you show doctors 3D images of things versus 2D images of things. So I just wanted to uh, share that for a second, too, and how the high-speed networks, like the 4G networks, are enabling some of that. This 3D technology is even enabling us to do things in kind of uh, more dry subjects, like accounting, to make it more engaging and to combine second life and uh, mobile. So you have interactive calculators in the background here, these little green boxes on the screen. And we can have either a mobile edition or a virtual world edition to show things like assets and liabilities, basic financial training. And some of the instructors are even finding there's a letter grade increase when they use this technology. And this is not just in one classroom. This is um, repeated over four uh, years of study, longitudinal study, with multiple classes. And uh, in, in the cases of our growth of our university, going from 200 students up to 800 students, and they're still getting a letter grade better um, based on the exact same content, um, even with the larger class sizes. So again, we want to grow with quality and quantity. And where we see mobile and virtual worlds actually coming together to have an educational outcome, that's something that we're pretty interested in. We're also excited about some of the things that are going on in uh, visual search and mobile augmented reality. This is an example of being able to uh, highlight over one of those cards that I showed you a little bit earlier, too. And uh, as you highlight over the card, it actually will launch 3D um, visual content for you so that you can make, uh, so that you can learn a medical procedure um, right there at kind of at your fingertips, just waving your device over a particular medical condition. So those are things that we're uh, starting to see as major advancements that are happening, too. And that's uh, reshaping learning and medicine, too, because we can even highlight over something um, in terms of medical procedure and uh, start to, uh, to, grow, to grow this uh, capability more. My last point is really around something that I think we can all get behind. 
there just aren't enough of us. There aren't enough people doing these types of activities. So part of our mission as a public, nonprofit university um, is to try and develop that talent pool, develop the processes, develop the education and the applications that are needed to do this. Moby MOOC has been a good start. I really appreciate that Inga has set this up and those of uh, you that have participated either as students or as faculty. And I've been an, a, an avid supporter of this because I think that that's a way to reach out to a broad audience and to start to grow that capability over time. Um, we've also started our own uh, Global Makers Club, which has been attracting 60, 70 uh, or more um, students who have an interest in mobile development. And we're trying to uh, find projects for them to work on to especially nonprofit projects from across the globe that uh, they can partner with people and understand how to work within teams as a programmer or a developer. So kind of in summary, you know, we can't, none of us can do this alone. That's why I love having things like the Moby MOOC that uh, we can come together. And whether it's for in learning or in health, you know, we have to look at ways we can work together across the globe. So again, public, nonprofit, university, we try and take on big projects with global impact, helping solve millennial goals, projects, other things like that. And we work with a wide variety of government, industry, uh, non-government organization uh, projects. And uh, those are some of the things that, uh, that, that we uh, will hopefully continue to, to have uh, uh, access to and that we can uh, continue to partner in. One of the uh, things I like to tell everyone is that one of our goals is to have a whole sustainable innovation pipeline where we're spinning off companies like the Ology Company brand that you see in the lower right-hand corner and um, also to develop that next generation of leaders and technologists and uh, looking at ways that we can do those things in, uh, in a more collaborative way. So there's more than I could you know, give in a short period of time, but I've uh, got a couple of books on the topic too. One called M Health, which is available from HIMSS. Um, it's available online some places too, or you can get it through their uh, mobile app that they have uh, for the MHIMS library. Um, and then I've also got a book called M Learning that I wrote a few years ago too. And that's some of where we had uh, coordinated and collaborated with Inga on uh, some of those things as well too and some of the other team members, too, that uh, I've seen and worked with in the MobyMOOC uh, framework, too. But uh, happy to take some questions or have some dialogue, too. I appreciate uh, the chat that you've had there, Elizabeth, as well, too. And, uh, you know, hopefully the, the connection hasn't been too bad for you to be able to hear. I know it is being recorded um, automatically from what Dana tells me, and hopefully it's uh, been a strong enough connection to uh, get most of what I was. I'm going to slide down to a couple other slides too, but uh, so I'll uh, be happy to share some of the samples uh, with you guys too, uh, no problem. So some of them, do they need connectivity or can, uh, can it download? Uh, for some of these projects, we've actually just allowed them to download the information and have it available. I'm sure I won't be able to find it right away in my deck, <laughs> but uh, I'll try in just a minute too. So, um, yeah, let's see, I think I'm getting closer here. And I'll turn some of these. We've done things like a patient safety app for um, teaching um, some of the uh, collaborative skills in patient safety using team steps as a procedure um, and our virtual patients. Let me, uh, let me see if I can also find, yeah, here we go. So um, one of the projects that we did that I didn't highlight in the other presentation is this one in Haiti where um, we needed to know where there were needs, critical needs. And we had an Android device that worked in offline and online mode. So if you're online, it would give you new um, text message updates and new satellite positions for the non-government workers, uh, organization workers like the Red Cross or um, the um, United Nations and where they were working. And this is a way to know which hospitals are open, which roads are closed, which ones have supplies, which ones don't. And um, I think I might have a bigger picture of it. Let me, let me see here. The, uh, for some reason, this uh, presentation decided to load in sideways. So uh, you have to bear with me for just a second while I get there and then uh, turn the uh, slide for you as well to uh, virtual space. But yeah, you can see a little bit better there. So a team from Tufts actually, uh, these, there are all these text messages and voice messages that came in in, in Creole and they actually converted them to English and then posted them on a geolocated map. 
our team made it so the map could be used offline as well and also would still have the satellite connection to see where people were. Um, but yeah, changing behaviors and, uh, you know, the um, indigenous uh, adolescent girls' health, we've done some campaigns like that in um, Tanzania as well as in um, Uganda and Kenya. So um, you'll see some of uh, those examples in later presentations too. We still don't have full clearance to show all of those things yet um, from our uh, past projects. But those are things that um, we continue to see huge, huge potential um, efforts in. We did one in Southeast Asia right before the um, uh, earthquake in Japan and uh, prepared 21 countries for what would happen if there was an earthquake in Japan six months before. So that's an, an example of simulation coming together. And um, Australia was one of the countries, Elizabeth, as well as uh, Singapore, Philippines, and uh, we simulated what would happen with the tsunami-like waves coming into Philippines and how they would handle it. So um, that was the same type of technology that we used in these, uh, these type of endeavors. So, um, Let's see, I think I have one of this. yeah, so. So there's a number of things that are challenges too in mHealth, and uh, maybe those are some things to think about too. Interoperability, the culture change, um, partnership, new care modalities. These are all things that I think we have to be mindful of as we start to not just foist technology onto the uh, doctors, but to actually look at ways that we can work with them and have the technology serve the needs of the practitioners. And the culture sensitivities, not just uh, um, of indigenous peoples and different um, geographies, but even organizational cultures have a big impact on uh, this. And I think we all have to be mindful of that too, um, especially those of us that are more technology oriented, that uh, it isn't always comfortable for people. A lot of what we do is to do um, TAM model, technology assess, uh, assessment model uh, studies to see if people truly are ready for some of the things that uh, we're putting out before them. And in some cases where the technology is really simple, when you can just talk to your phone and it recognizes your voice and uh, automatically gives you the information that you want, even though it's a very sophisticated technology, it seems really, really um, basic and easy to an end user, especially even in a semi-literate population where the spoken word is uh, more important than uh, what's on the screen. Um, those are things that we kind of uh, try and think about in this next wave. And I think going beyond the smartphone and the tablet and the devices to how all the devices work together holistically in an ecosystem, whether it's the peripheral devices, the electronic health records, the mobile device, all working together, that's really important. That's something that I think we're going to see some great impacts and improvements on over time, especially in telemedicine and some of these other disciplines that I posted before too, which are part of this in-health universe. I think there's so many different areas that uh, we could see see improvement and, uh, and uh, opportunities. So I'm really glad that you guys decided to join. I know some of you, it's already uh, uh, early, early morning time, and others it's late at night, too, so I uh, do appreciate that, too. And for those of you that didn't join, I hope you enjoy the recording, too. We're going to stay in dialogue a little bit through uh, text here for a few more minutes, but that does kind of conclude the uh, formal portion of the presentation, if it is formal. And uh, do appreciate, again, you guys coming today.